Acts chapter 2 and verse 39, the word of the Lord says this, the promise. I'm going to say the promise. Everybody say the promise. It's for you. Someone say me. It's for your children. Someone say my children. It is to all. It's not just for you. It's for your children. And it's to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The promise is. It's not the promise might be, the promise could be, the promise is. And that promise is for you. That promise is for your children. It's to everybody. It doesn't matter the societal status, race, gender. It is for everybody. And that statement, those that are far off, no matter how far off you feel from God, it's for those that are far off. You may feel a million miles away from God right now, but I'm telling you this promise is for not just those that are near God, but those that feel like they're far off from God. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, according as his divine power, what you feel here today is the divine power of God. And that divine power that you feel in this place can give to you all things. What things does he give? The things that pertain to life and godliness. God is not like the devil that sets you up for a fall and sets you up and he pulls a fast one on you. And at the end of the day, you didn't read the fine print and now you find yourself left with a mess. But the things that God gives to you by his divine power are life and godliness. And it says, through the knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue. This isn't ordinary power. This is divine power. And he's going to give us everything today that pertains to life and godliness. This word glory that you read here means uh, a very apparent dignity, honor. This, this God of glory, he called us to things that are very apparent, things that are very dignified and honorable. The word virtue means valor, excellence, praise. And so God's glory, God's presence is going to reverse that retreat that you are in. And when you get this promise from God, it gives you a valor. It literally means a manliness, not going to turn you from being a lady into a man, but just a courage that is about somebody. It can be given to you by this virtue. And this word connected to the glory of God, it's more than just a definition. It is it is an implied energy and efficiency that you have never had before. It, it, the word defined by itself means valor and boldness and courage. But when it comes from the presence of God, it's more than just that mere definition. There is an impartation of a, a, a righteousness from God that gives you an energy that you didn't have before. And we go on reading here in verse 4 of Second Peter whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises. God's given to us something that is so exceeding and so precious. And some would say it's a promise. That by these, you might be partakers of the divine nature. We have fallen nature. We have limitations and we have failures. But God... For this moment, if you are unfamiliar with just kind of where things go off course or off schedule and there's just a random breakout of people praying and worshiping and you're just kind of like, what in the world is going on? That is the divine nature walking by and brushing up against us to see if you're at all curious in investigating and exploring it. When that prophet Elijah walked by Elisha, the Bible says his mantle just kind of brushed up against him just to see if out of curiosity that young man wanted to follow and go further into what he came in contact with. He didn't experience the fullness of that mantle, but something about that mantle wired him to want to further investigate what you felt here, that overwhelming sensation in presence, and you didn't know what to run, to hide, to flee, to stand, to fall, to spit, to cry, to do what? It is to see if you're curious as to what it leads to and what you'll find when you get in the middle of it. 
And so in Romans chapter 5, I told you I'm going to move fast because I'm just going to make a point and we're going to have an altar call. In verse 1 and 2, it says, we're justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Also, we have access by faith into the grace we stand. Without faith, the promises are inaccessible. But by faith, we have access. Who wants to access that promise today? God has a promise for you, your children, and to all. No matter how far off you are, it is accessible by faith. And through hope, and this, this is this grace where we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Though hope's not seen, it, 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 it can be, ex- this, this rejoicing can happen inside something that is not seen. But the power of the hope is the glory of salvation. I'm just going to hurry. I want to, there's a number of points I want to make, but I got, I'm going to keep true to my word here. Verse three says, we glory in tribulations. Also tribulation works, patience, patience, experience, experience, hope, and hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy ghost. What I have learned is that my hope that God has extended to me is not hype because after all is said, And after all is done and the dust settles, my hope, my joy remains because what I have in my heart is the Holy Ghost. This love that is shed abroad in my heart. That word shed abroad means it pours out, it gushes out, it spills forth, it runs over. When you receive the Holy Ghost, when you receive the promise of God into your heart, though everything externally seems completely haywire and beyond your control, and you should succumb to the forces around you, there is a promise that comes from God that is his spirit inside of you. And that Holy Spirit will cause there to be an overflow, a spilling forth of joy that comes from his presence Now, verse 16 of chapter 4. I want to read a few more verses. We're almost there. It says, therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all. God wants us to be certain to all seed. Remember, to you, to your children, to all that are far off. And he says, this promise is certain to all offspring to all seed in verse 17 it says this is the kind of god that we serve he calls those things which be not as though they were and in verse 18 you might feel like everything's against hope but you can still believe in hope and it was talking about abraham and he had every reason to be completely discouraged and hold and hang his shoulders down but it says that even though everything was against his hope he still believed in hope. And in verse 19, he was not weak in the faith. Verse 20, he staggered not. He didn't separate. He didn't withdraw. He didn't oppose. He didn't doubt. He did not waver in his faith because he wasn't considering his ability. He was considering the promise that God gave him. He staggered not at the promise of God. Someone say the promise. This promise, I want to to encourage you to be strong in faith here today. Verse 21, I want you to be fully persuaded today. What God has promised, he's also able to perform. If you have a promise, there will be a performance. If you have a promise, if you've never heard from God, God's never indicated anything to you at any point, I'm going to give you your first promise here today. There is a promise To you, to your children, and to all. That means everyone in this room, no matter how far off you are from God right now, no matter how low or no prayer you got going on in your world, no matter what kind of level of knowledge you do or do not have, there is a promise. If you've never heard from God, you are going to hear from God today that there is a promise for you and for your future, and to all, no matter how far off you are from God. And since you are going to be given a promise, there will be a performance if you have what it says in verse 
uh, uh, 21 here, a persuasion. Paul says Abraham was fully persuaded that God was able to perform what he had promised. Does anyone sense in this air right now a persuasion, an expectation that God's about to do something exceeding and do above and beyond anything that you can ask or even think right now? As we read from the Apostle Peter just a few portions of Scripture ago, there's exceeding and great precious promises that are in this room right now. And if you want... And if you would like, you can experience your promise today. Someone say in Jesus name. Verse 23. What we're reading right now, you're thinking, well, you're just reading from some old ancient book. It is old. It is ancient, but doesn't mean it don't apply no more. Gravity's old, but it still applies right now. God's old, but he still applies right now. This word is old, but it still applies right now. Now, and so what we just read in verse 23, Paul says, it wasn't just written for Abraham's sake alone. But in verse 24, he says, it's for us also. If we believe, someone say, I'm going to believe. Someone say, I believe the promise. Man, I wish more than five people would say, I believe. I, I wish a host of people in this room would shout, I believe the promise. God's about to do it here today. Ezekiel 47. I promise you, we're not killing nothing around. God is about to break forth if we push forth. Just like a moment ago, you know, you you sensed it when you walked into this room. But we kept pushing and kept pushing. And there was a fight in our spirit. And if you got a persuasion and a willingness to fight, you are going to get the promise today. Verse 1, reading from the New Living Translation says this, in my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. I know I'm asking you to repeat a lot of things, but someone say the temple. And there at this temple, I saw a stream flowing. Some of you could hear it in the background right now. And from beneath the door of the temple, someone say the temple. And passing to the right of the altar. It says the man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway. He led me around to the eastern entrance and there I could see the water flowing out. And as he was measuring as he went and and he went along that stream of water that was flowing out the temple, 1700 plus feet. And the water was to my ankles and he measured off another 1750 feet and led me across again. This time the water was to my knees And then we went another 1750 feet and it was up to my waist. Then we went out another 1750 feet and the river was too deep to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. And he asked me, have you been watching son of man? You here today in this temple, have you been watching what's been going on in this room today? Have you been observing and looking around what in the world is going on? The angel of the Lord, the God speaking to this man here says, you've seen, have you been paying attention? I hope you have been. I hope you've been watching. I hope you've been looking. I hope you've been observing. And it says, then he led me back along the riverbank. And when I returned... I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. See, Ezekiel didn't recognize what happened as he followed the stream. But when he stopped and looked back, he saw what the waters flowing from the temple had done. You might not see what is happening as you're following the flow. But if we would just stop for a moment and lift up our head and look back, we will see what the Lord has done. You may not see it as you're going. But the God of heaven says, Ezekiel, why don't you look back and return? And he began to see everywhere he went with the waters, there was life that followed. The enemy wants to get your eyes off of what the Lord has done. We keep our eyes on the prize, yes. But every once in a while, the enemy will try to eclipse what God is doing. But that enemy is so small. He just looks big because he's up close to you right now. But just for a moment, just put your hand in his face. 
and look back, grab that enemy's head and lay, look what's been happening, devil. Look what's been happening. As long as I'm following the flow, as long as I'm following the stream, God has been giving life and it's not the same as it was before. He goes, look it. He says, Ezekiel, check this out. The river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of this stream, not another stream, but this stream, they'll make any salty water of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. There will be swarms of living things wherever this water of river flows. Fish are going to abound. Its waters will become fresh and life will flow. Flourish wherever the waters flow. The waters came from the temple. And wherever the waters flowed, life came to what it came in contact with. Now we're reading a scene here from the Old Testament about this temple. But look what the New Testament says in verse 19 of Corinthians 6. Your body is the temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. The waters flowed out the entrance and around the right side of the altar. See, if we're on the right side of the altar, those waters are going to flow out. Now, God has shifted directions of the rivers. It used to be we had to flow to the temple to find the river. But God prophesied to Ezekiel that the waters are going to now flow out of the temple. People had to go. You remember that conversation Jesus had with the woman at the well in John chapter 4? They're trying to argue, where do you go to find the river? You know, do we worship here? Do we worship there? Do we go here? Do we go there? And Jesus says, the hour is coming. Things are about to shift. There's going to be a change of direction in the streams. And so he says that the waters are going to start to flow out of the temple. Who's the temple in the New Testament? We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. I love what I feel in here. But according to prophecy, we're just swimming in ankle deep waters right now. Put it this way. Church is just getting your feet wet. We're, what was just happened here? We could have thought we were, you know, head over in the presence of God. And yes, we were getting in the presence of God. But God says, what starts in here is to flow out there. And you are that temple. And the more, the more you go out, the deeper it gets. In church, you're getting your feet wet. In church, you're getting in- introduced to the rivers of living water. In church, you're just beginning to experience the presence of God at a level you've never experienced before. But out there where the dead is, out there where the dry places are, that's where you start walking and it gets a little knee deep. That's if you just reach out a little further, go out another 1,700 feet and you're going to get waist deep in it. But go out another 1,700 feet and you're going to be like a sheep amongst wolves. And that's where there's waters to swim in. That's where it's only the presence of God that can hold you up and you can walk into areas of God you've never experienced before. Let's lift our hands. The Holy Ghost is here right now. Lift your hands. I I want to encourage you. Even if you don't feel it, even if you're not used to it, if you would just, just obey what the Holy Ghost is trying to do, begin to talk and call on the name of Jesus right now. In Jesus' name. Come on, there's unity here right now. That's it. Lift up your hands. There's unity in this place right now. We are in one mind. We are in one cord. We are in one place. And there's going to be about a one Lord, one faith, one baptism that occurs in this room right now. God is for a spirit of unity as we reach up together. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus spoke in John seven thirty seven. Is anyone here thirsty? Come to me and drink. And if you believe on me, as the scripture said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. The rivers were in the temple, in a physical place, a, a, a building. But now God says, I'm building a church and your body is the temple. 
And that's where the rivers are going to start flowing. See, when we think of the Holy Ghost, we like to think as Pentecostals, the Holy Ghost fire. And it is Holy Ghost fire. It is a refining. It is an igniting. It is a passionate element. But it's not just fire. It's a water. It's a life source. And, and there's even though there's fire in the temple, there in the presence of God, God says, I'm going to let rivers flow out of temple. And it's going to go into the desert and dead places and bring life. And now Jesus in the the New Testament is saying you are going to have those waters flow out of you. What is he talking about? What are those waters? Verse 39. This he's talking about the spirit, the Holy Ghost. You should receive it. You need to receive it. He's talking to the believers that believe on him, but he says, you don't got it yet. I know you believe, but I'm going to make sure that you are going to flow with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a separate experience from the belief experience. And I'm about to give it to you. Jesus said, I promise it to you. First Corinthians, so let's move forward. Let's keep going. Acts 1.8. I'm going to hurry up. You shall receive power. Acts 1.8. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you're going to be witnesses. Unto me in Jerusalem. Judea. Samaria. And to the uttermost part of the earth. The rivers that started in Jerusalem. Where the Holy Ghost downpour happened. The promise is there that there would be waters to swim in. That it would go to those that are far off. And there's people that are far off. And the further we go out with this Holy Ghost message, we are going to see the deeper things of God that we want to see. As I, we were in a session yesterday about being in motion, about putting the go in gospel. And it was amazing. This man began to talk and share stories that were just unbelievable. It was amazing. This guy who teaches 30 to 40 Bible studies, he talks to 30, 40 different people every week. And, and as he goes, God would just begin to do the miraculous, the supernatural. And it's just like we listened to a sermon to get on a prayer night uh, a few months ago about sheep amongst wolves, the power of launching out into the, 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 the fearful things, the scary things, the things that we are afraid of that we know we can't do in our own ability. But as we go into the places where we have to depend on the spirit of God. The spirit of God shows up. If you don't need God, you don't need to show up. But if you need him, when you go out, he says, you're the temple. And I'm going to make sure that the waters flow out of you. I'm going to make sure that I use you. I'm going to make sure you operate in areas that you've never operated in before. Hear me, if you're here today and you have the Holy Ghost, but you want to see the gifts of the spirit and you want to see the supernatural, you have to step out further. Yes, it starts in this room, stepping out of your comfort zone and actually worshiping when you feel uncomfortable to worship. It starts in here feeling uncomfortable and coming to an altar when you're not used to coming to an altar or not comfortable with that kind of atmosphere. It's pushing you. That's when you get your feet wet. But if you ever learn to get your feet wet, you're just going to keep following the stream that's flowing out of you. And it's going to take you to deeper places. And when you go out deeper into the spirit, the spirit's going to completely immerse you and you'll begin to go into places that their thought there would be no life and life is going to break forth. But those here that have not received this promise, listen very closely, Acts 237. When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. They felt a compulsion. They felt conviction. They said, what do we do? And Peter said in verse 38, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for missions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Someone say the Holy Ghost. This promise is to you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And if you don't believe this, let me just throw a few verses at you. When the Bible says promise, God don't lie. God does not lie. He's not like your family member that might have lied to you. He's not like your former BFF that lied to you. He is God. And God doesn't play games with someone's soul. God does not lie. Here's a few verses for you to consider. Romans 3, 4 says, let God be true and every man a liar. In 2 Corinthians 1, 20, it says all the promises of God, every single last one of them in God, in him are yea and in him. Amen. Hebrews 6, 18 says there's two things that cannot change about God. And one of them is it's impossible for God to lie. I love Numbers 23, 19. 
God's not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Did God say it? Won't he do it? Did God speak it? Don't you think he'll make good his promise? That's literally what, whatever God promised, you can take it to the bank. Just like someone writes you a million dollar check, you got that check and you believe the person that signed there. You may not see each penny physically. You may not see each dollar physically. You may not see it, but that piece of paper with that inscription that's been put onto that paper, that ink that's been put on that paper signed by that name has the full authority for you to take it and cash in on it. And so when God gives you a promise and he says, you're going to get it, it is for you. You got to be fully persuaded and you have access by faith. You have access to the gift by faith. If you would simply believe with all your heart, Isaiah 55, and I'm, I'm wrapping up right now. It's 254. I'm very aware of the time. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, calling him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. And this is where your battleground is right now. You got the promise and you got your thoughts. You got what God said and you got what your mind is saying. But your, your thoughts are unrighteous. They're incorrect. They're not right. You're not thinking right if you're thinking different than what God said. God will give you mercy and he'll abundantly pardon. God said in verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Whatever your thoughts are right now, whatever analyzations going on through your mind, whatever justifiable things you're making in your mind that makes it, you need to cast down every thought to the obedience of Christ. You need to surrender every thought of yours to God and just say, God, it doesn't make sense to me, but you promised him. And God, you do not lie. God, whatever you said you're going to perform, I'm not going to stagger at the promise. I have access to it by faith. And Lord, I'm fully persuaded. I won't be weak in my faith. I will pursue the promise. And if you have a promise, there's going to be a performance. And in verse 10, it says, here's how God's word works. Just like the rain coming down and the snow from heaven. It says it waters the earth and it brings forth and it buds just like that water from the temple flowing. And there's people in this room, you're, you're getting your feet wet. You're getting introduced to the flow of the rivers, but you're just, you're just getting your feet wet. There's so much more and everything that river touches, it brings forth life. It buds and it grows. And so will my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It won't return to me void. Whatever I say, it's going to come back. It will accomplish exactly what I said it will do. Let's stand together. Acts 2.38. Peter said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What is the Holy Ghost? It's the promise, verse 39. The Holy Ghost is the promise for you. The Holy Ghost is a promise for your children. The Holy Ghost is a promise to all, no matter how far off you are, because God is calling everyone. And what the Holy Ghost says in verse 8 of Acts 1 says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in this place right now. Uh, the, the persuasion I have right now is because through this week, I was swimming in waters of that river, knowing that it came from the right side of the altar. And if you find yourself on the right side of the altar today, you're going to get more than your feet wet you're going to leave this place and your knees are going to get wet. You're going to leave this place and you'll be up to your chest. You're going to walk out of this place and you're going to be swimming in something you never thought you'd be swimming in before. And I'm not talking about trouble. I'm talking about triumph. I'm talking about victory. I'm talking about the joy of the Lord being your strength. Does anyone believe that here today? If you believe that God is true, and if you believe that God does not lie, and if you believe what was just preached is for everyone, I want you to join me up front here on the right side of the altar. 
you get coming up to the front here would be the right side of the altar to find yourself today. If you believe what we just felt in this place, but not just what we felt, what was declared by the word of God. And you want to find yourself not just getting your feet wet, but you want to go into the deeper things of God. This is your altar call to have today. This is your moment right now to find yourself swimming in waters when you leave this place. Because what happens here, your belly is going to flow with rivers of living water. And then you walk out of this place. See, we think so often that the only presence of God I can feel is in the house of God. But God says, you, you are the temple of God. And you, this temple is meant for the, the rivers of living water, the Holy Ghost to be inside of. In the Old Testament, that's where they find the waters. But God says, I put the waters inside of you. And so when everywhere you go, you... They had to always bring everybody to the priest for the priest to purify, for the priest to cleanse somebody, for the priest to sacrifice for somebody. But God says, now you're the priesthood and now you're the temple. And now I put the spirit inside of you. And so when you walk out in the street, you know, Michael, you don't have to have some certificate and PhD of nothing in Pentecost. All you got to do is have the rivers that have flowed out of you. And when you go to your, your neighborhood, your job place, if someone says, hey, Michael, I'm sick, you don't have to take them to this church. Church, you got to just put, take your hand and say, in the name of Jesus, and the rivers flow, the rivers flow. And all of a sudden there's a miracle that happens. There's a breakthrough that happens. This church, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you have the rivers that can flow out in this place throughout this area. And what's going to happen when they experience the river? They're going to come to the right side of the altar and they're going to get their feet wet and they're going to get the river flowing and they're going to go back out there with the river and the river's going to be knee deep, waist deep. It's going to be swimming out there. Watertown really is going to be Watertown. It really is going to have rivers of living water town. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. God is about to change the culture of Watertown. We're going to have rivers of living water flowing over the banks of Broadway, over the banks of Maple Street, over the banks of Kemp. God's about to do exceeding abundantly if you believe that. Looks like everybody does because we're all on the right side of the altar. You all ready? God's about to fill someone with the Holy Ghost right now. Because it is for you. And it's for your children. And it's to all. No matter how far off you feel right now. God says this is the promise. Someone say the promise. Does God lie? Do you think God's teasing you right now? God's about to give you the Holy Ghost right now. Right now. I want you to lift up your hands. And if you don't want to get them too tired, you can just put them maybe about waist high, okay? I understand your arms can get tired, but just as a sign of surrender, just put those hands upward towards heaven and begin to say, God, I want those rivers of living water. Lord, I don't want anything else in me right now. Empty me. I empty myself of every dead water. I empty myself of every dead sin. Jesus, I don't want to be far off anymore. Lord, I want to get my feet wet here today in the Holy Ghost. I want those rivers of living water right now. That's it. The Holy Ghost is here right now. God's about to fill you with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost right now.